Was Jesus just a myth? Did Paul believe in a real historical Jesus? And wait until you see this angry atheist throw the book at Jeff Durbin and James White. All of this, we look at the scripture of the day and more. My name is Hayden Clark, and this is Help Me Believe. So, is Jesus a myth, or was Jesus simply a myth? This is something, an idea that has gained popularity on YouTube and amongst uh, lay audiences. Not in scholarship, that's a good thing to uh, point out, but anyway, uh, let's address the question. Was Jesus simply a myth? Before we start looking at some positive evidence for the existence of Jesus, let's take a look at some of the arguments that you hear from uh, these people that are known as Jesus mythicists. Uh, one of uh, the most popular uh, objections is that there's no archaeological evidence of Jesus. Ooh, he must not have existed. There's no coins with his face on it. There's no inscriptions, that sort of thing. Um, is this good evidence that he didn't exist? Is this supposed to lead us towards the proposition that he didn't exist? Of course not. First of all, who from the first century does have archaeological evidence? Not very many people, mostly just a handful of very uh, famous politicians and people of that sort. You would have to have been a well-off aristocrat to even uh, have some sort of archaeological evidence for yourself. And even if you did, there's a good chance that it wouldn't have lasted for 2,000 years. So this is just uh, not a good ob objection at all. Um, all it means is that's not how we're going to figure out if Jesus did actually exist. So remember that Jesus was just a simple, poor, peasant, Jewish, itinerant preacher in the first century. Why would we even expect to find archaeological evidence of him? It's not expected, and nobody is surprised that there isn't any. A second common objection that you hear from Jesus' mythicists is that there, we have no writings from Jesus himself. Again, this surprises absolutely nobody. In the first century, most people were illiterate. So whenever I died, there will be a bunch of audio, video, and uh, writings, if you keep up with the blog, that, that will attest to the fact that I actually existed. However, I live in a time and place where most people are literate. In fact, I had somebody uh, come into work one time, a customer, who could not read or write, and so he couldn't sign his name. Um, and that was that was crazy. It was crazy that somebody today in 2019 uh, didn't know how to read or write. It was an older gentleman, though, that never went to school, so it was understandable, at least to some degree. But it's still just mind-blowing that there was somebody alive today, in the United States, that is, anyway, in this in this context, that couldn't read or write. That, that seems bizarre to us. Not bizarre in the first century. Not at all. In fact, most people could not read or write. So the idea that... Uh, Jesus, somebody who existed in the first century, doesn't have any writings, surprises absolutely no historians, and no historians count this as evidence against his existence. Another common one you'll hear is that there are no Greek or Romans in the first century who write about Jesus. If Jesus was this famous preacher or whatever, why don't we see any uh, uh, first century Romans or Greeks writing about him? Obvious question. Why on earth would they? Again, why would they write about a backwoods Jew Jewish peasant. It, 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 we have no reason to expect that they would. They certainly wouldn't have been followers of Jesus, so why would they write about him? There were plenty of itinerant preachers at the time, even, even um, more than one person claiming to be the Jewish Messiah. They simply did not care. Why would we expect to find it in their writings? But of course, this objection is actually false if you consider that Luke was most likely a Greek physician. Of course, the Jewish mythicists will probably not count that. Luke didn't actually write that gospel. He, we don't even know that Luke existed, blah, 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 blah. Well, you asked, and now you have been answered. You ask, and you shall receive. But uh, more importantly, how many Greeks or Romans in the first century mentioned Pontius Pilate? Well, Luke does if you want to count him again, but I'm betting you don't want to count him. Other than that, zero. How many uh, mention uh, Flavius Josephus? Zero. So this objection is not an objection at all. It's not something we should, should ex even expect to find. So it's not surprising, again, to any historians. These last two are my favorite. I just love them. The Gospels don't count as sources for Jesus because they're biased. Uh, so This is so rich. I want to like put it on a plaque up on my wall behind me. First, this is just as stupid as saying uh, medical textbooks don't count because they're written by doctors. If that sounds stupid, that's what this objection sounds like to me. Well, doctors are experts in their field. Of course they count. Exactly. Those who were closest to Jesus would be the best sources to look at if we wanted to know about him, especially if we even just wanted to know that he existed. 
Secondly, this claim of bias insinuates that they had some motive to lie. That's what you're really getting at, that they were lying about this. They just made the story up. People don't just make stuff up or lie for no reason. So I will wait the rest of my life to hear a good response to why would they lie. It's not going to happen. Hey, Peter. Yeah, John, what's up? You want to make up a story about how the Messiah came and was crucified and rose from the dead? Yeah, sure, buddy. I, I can't wait to be persecuted. In fact, I woke up this morning thinking how much I just want to give up my livelihood. Good luck with that. Most importantly, the atheist making this objection, or not necessarily an atheist, but the mythicist making this objection is also biased. You know why? Because all people are biased. And if we should dismiss people who are biased, then we shouldn't listen to anyone, including ourselves. And so this objection is actually self-defeating. Unless you are so arrogant as to claim to be the bastion of objectivity and claim that you have no biases. If that's you, you're excused from the dialogue. But of course, Biased people can make true claims. I'm biased. I want Christianity to be true. I'm fine saying that. You know why? Because it doesn't mean anything. It, it wouldn't mean anything if I was the most biased person in the world. I was raised a Christian, and I believe it because my parents told me it was true. And now I'm simply going out to find evidence to confirm what I already believe. That wouldn't matter at all. You would still have to weigh the evidence on the basis of reality, of is it good reasoning, is it good evidence, does it actually corroborate the claim. It, it just, the bias thing just means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. And when you hear it, you can simply dismiss it. It doesn't matter. Another one that I hear often is that the Gospels are not independent of each other. They're, Matthew and Luke are dependent on Mark, and, and probably John is too. This amounts to nothing more than somebody who heard that uh, Matthew and Luke borrow a lot, uh, about 90% of Mark's gospel is included in theirs, and then they just ran with that. They didn't, they don't, they didn't read the scholarly uh, opinion on this or anything like that. They, they, they have no idea what they're talking about. They just heard that, and they're like, ooh, I can use this against the Christians. This will be a good one. They can't come back from this one. Well, it's really not hard. About 20% of Matthew's gospel is unique. About 35% of Luke's gospel is unique. Matthew and Luke share a common separate source apart from Mark, and there's <laughs> there's... Little to no evidence that John's gospel is dependent on the other three at all. And so for you math whizzes out there, that's five separate independent and early sources for the existence of Jesus. And by the way, that's I should really say it's at least five independent sources because the gospel writers would have probably in all likelihood have used multiple sources as they uh, created their gospels. When we say there's five sources, we mean at, at least five sources or traditions. There would have been multiple independent people along the way, so there's no telling how many actual independent sources we have here, but we have at least five. And if that's not good enough for you, then I, I don't know what to tell you. I guess you're excused from the dialogue because you're, you're not willing to do honest historical investigation because five independent early sources is good enough to establish a consensus, which is what we have in scholarship. There is a scholarship in, cons in a scholarly consensus. This, did Jesus exist, is not a question that actual scholars ask. What they're asking nowadays is, what can we know about Jesus? The question of Jesus' existence was solved uh, in modern scholarship 30 years ago. So what you have is the lay audience is about 30 years behind the scholarship, which is typical with lay audience versus scholarship, but I mean, just get with the times. He existed. There's absolutely no question. And the five independent sources that we find in the Gospels should be good enough to convince um, any reasonable person. But even if it's not, um, I'm going to get to a few more. But first, uh, some some outside the Gospel. But first, Gospels. But first, I want to point out that all of the objections, sparing the last two, are nothing but arguments from silence. They're arguments based on what we don't see, what you don't find, what somebody did not say. That is a fallacious argument. That is a logical fallacy known as an argument from silence. It's not a good way to argue. In fact, again, it's a fallacious way to argue. It's a logical fallacy. It does not count for anything. Arguments from silence mean nothing. Well, let's look at a, a couple of sources, and I'm going to limit myself to those that there's a consensus on. Pliny the Younger. He was a governor of the Roman province, um, Bithynia Pontus, and uh, we have some of his writings that are, uh, he's going back and forth with the emperor Trajan. And in letter 10 to Trajan, or, which uh, you know is estimated around 112 CE, this is uh, the one of most importance to us. 
So he's writing to Trajan, trying to figure out uh, what he's supposed to do with these pesty Christians. He's not sure uh, what he's supposed to do with them, those that are in his uh, province. And in, in doing so, he describes a Christian worship service in which Christians are, quote, singing hymns to Christ as to a god. So how would he be familiar with these uh, Christian worship service? He almost certainly had not read the Gospels, and so... Uh, he probably got it from the Christians that he had um, been in contact with, or former Christians, those who had deconverted. Um, there's no evidence of a later Christian interpolation. I don't care what somebody on YouTube or whatever says in scholarship. Nobody thinks that this is an interpolation. There's nothing inconsistent in uh, uh, his writings here. So the idea that Jesus, the Christ, was a person worshipped by early Christians as to a god was clearly well known enough that it had reached the politicians. Another Roman source is Tacitus, who was a Roman biographer, and he wrote his Annals of Imperial Rome around 115 CE, which chronicled the history of Rome from 14 to 68 CE. And he says that there was a great fire in the city uh, around 64 CE that consumed a large portion of the populace. It was a big deal. It was very bad. And uh, Tacitus blames the fire on the emperor, actually. And he says that the emperor used Christians as a scapegoat because, you know, everybody already hated them. And so he placed the blame, or he shifted the blame, onto the Christians. And uh, here's uh, what Tacitus records of interest for our purposes. It says, The author of this name, Christ, was put to death by the procurator Pontius Pilate while Tiberius was emperor. But the dangerous superstition, though suppressed for the moment, broke out again, not only in Judea, the origin of this evil, but even in the city that is of Rome. Now, this is a very specific and explicit reference to a Christ who was put to death by Pontius Pilate and Tiberius. Does that sound familiar? It should. It corroborates the Gospels. Here's a Jewish source. Flavius Josephus was a first century Jewish historian. Uh, he lived through the war, and afterward he was given a position by the Romans. In his writing, Antiquities, which was written around the end of the first century, we find an explicit, explicit reference to Jesus by name. It's, uh, Josephus says that in 62 CE, the Roman governor was withdrawn, and the high priest um, used this opportunity to put James, quote, the brother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Messiah to death. That's from uh, Antiquities. Again, Jesus is referenced by name, and Josephus adds that Jesus had a brother and was thought, to, thought by some to be the Jewish Messiah. And there's no actual evidence of a later Christian interpolation here. You only hear that from people that are trying to, to um, prevent this from being evidence. Now, Josephus has a, a second passage that is um, uh, much more hotly debated, and, well, it's not really controversial at all because we all agree that there is a later Christian interpolation in this passage. However, the majority of classical scholars agree that the interpolation can be removed and reference to Jesus still remains and appears authentically Josephan. Now, people who try to say that the whole passage can be removed and it fits nicely with the text ignore the fact that the testimonium is a, di is a digression and that there are other digressions in the text around it. So, of course, if you remove a digression from the text, the text continues to flow nicely. That's what a digression is. Again, the, the overwhelming majority of scholars believe the passage to be authentically Josephan, with a few words added by later Christians. I guess they just couldn't help themselves. Now, some try to use another argument from silence, which we just uh, decided is, or we, we just learned is logically fallacious, to argue against the Josephus passage. They say, why doesn't anyone quote the passage until Eusebius in the 4th century? Why didn't the 2nd and 3rd century Christian apologists uh, tr use this text? Well, obviously, the battles that the 2nd and 3rd century Christian apologists were facing did not necessitate them to quote a non-Christian source like Josephus. Again, this is an argument from silence, so it can be dismissed out of hand, but to answer the question directly, that's why. They had no need of it that wouldn't have uh, bolstered their, the arguments that they were trying to make. So it's a completely irrelevant objection. Most importantly, remember that Josephus almost certainly hadn't read the Gospels and would have got his information from somewhere else, so we have a, an independent source here as well. So here's what we can conclude. New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman, no friend of conservative Christianity, so you know he's purely objective, 
he concludes that there are no less than seven independent sources within a hundred years of Jesus' supposed death that attest to his existence. This is, this is an extremely rare occurrence um, for figures of antiquity. Add on to, the, to this the fact that Jesus was just a, a backwoods Jewish peasant, and this is, it's, abs- it's absolutely bizarre that we have so much attestation to his existence. If this isn't good enough for you, I don't know what to tell you. Every Christian and non-Christian source for 1,800 years assumed that Jesus was a historical figure, even if they didn't believe the miracles, he rose from the dead, son of God, all of that. Nobody questioned that he was a real historical figure. You have to go to the 18th century before you find your first source claiming that Jesus wasn't a real person. So you'll see how I have argued from um, actual data that we have from history. If you were to do the same, which you should on the opposing side, you would have to start with an 18th century source. The early antagonists of Christianity never dreamed of making the claim that Jesus was simply a myth. So so why do so many modern uh, non-scholar skeptics, why do they do this? To assume the best, perhaps they're just ignorant of the flood of evidence or how we investigate historical uh, claims from antiquity. Um, but to assume the likely... They, it's probably just because they don't want it to be true. They don't, they don't want Christianity to be true, and if they can cut it off from the source and just say, Jesus never even existed, you can't prove it, then you know they don't have to deal with anything else. However, to point out, once again, this is not a scholarly thing to do. Scholars decided 30 years ago that Jesus was a historical person. Today, they aren't even interested in the question. There is a consensus on this, and what they're asking now is, what can we know about this Jesus figure? But before we get off this subject, let me offer the mythicist a cop-out. Just because Jesus existed doesn't mean he rose from the dead, and it certainly doesn't mean that he was the Son of God or anything like that. There's plenty of atheists and agnostics, like Bart Ehrman, who believe that Jesus existed for all of the overwhelming evidence, and um, they don't believe that, uh, obviously, Jesus was the Son of God or anything like that. So these things don't go hand in hand. In fact, aside from Bob Price and Richard Carrier, uh, there are no scholars in the field who believe that Jesus didn't exist. Jesus' mythicism only exists on YouTube and in popular writings, that sort of stuff. You'll see it come up around Christmas and Easter in order to get clicks and to sell books and that sort of stuff. But whatever you do, remember that there is overwhelming evidence that Jesus existed. And to ignore it or deny it, try and twist it, is not something that you're going to find in scholarship. I want to take a look at another popular claim by Jesus Mythicist, but before we do, I wanted to remind you that you can support Help Me Believe for as little as a dollar a month by following the description in the link below labeled Support Help Me Believe, and with that, you can get uh, bonus material and access to Q&A, early releases, that sort of stuff. Just follow the link in the description and become a supporter. Okay, so these mythicist types will often claim that Paul, one of our earliest Christian sources, never mentions a historical or physical Jesus. That Paul just believed in this Christ myth or this spiritual Messiah, something like that. That's usually what the claim is. Um, First of all, even if that were true, it would be another argument from silence. Good grief, they just can't get away from it. I, I hope you're picking up on the horrible reasoning that keeps coming over and over again. But secondly, the claim is obviously false. So here's an article by Eric Manning titled, 27 Times Paul Proved He Knew the Historical Jesus. I would amend that to say that Paul believed in the historical Jesus, or Paul was familiar with the historical Jesus, something like that. But uh, let's look at a few of Paul's writings that prove that he really did believe in a real historical, physical Jesus. And you can read them all if you want by following the link in the description. Okay, in Galatians 3.16, Paul says that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. Does that sound like a spiritual Christ, an unhistorical person? Of course not. Now, Paul believed Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, the promised seed of Abraham that would bring the nations together into one kingdom. This is not a spiritual Christ or whatever. He may have believed in the spiritual Christ, but he also believed in a real Jewish, Jewish Messiah. In Romans 1.3, Paul says that Jesus was the promised heir to King David's throne. Again, do spiritual Christs uh, have a human lineage like King David? No. Paul believed Jesus was a real Jew in the lineage of King David. That description would not apply to a mere spiritual Christ or whatever. Paul believed Jesus was a real human person. And as if Paul could not be more clear about this, in Galatians 4.4, he literally says that Jesus was born of a woman. 
Are spiritual Christs born at all? No. And are they born of women? No. They're not born at all because they're simply spiritual. Again, Paul believed that Jesus was a real human person. And I'm not going to go into all the other verses. This is more than satisfactory. But if you want to look, there's even more. There's a plethora of verses where Paul clearly believes in a real, physical, historical Jesus. Okay, now it's time for my favorite segment of the show. It's called Angry Atheist. I just created it. I'm just making this up. Uh, if you have not watched this video, it may be the best video I've ever seen on the internet. You are missing out on pure gold. Don't miss this. Follow the link in the description. Uh, this guy's name is Greg Clark. Literally never heard of him before seeing this video, and you're about to see why. Anyway, this guy was in a debate, uh, if you could call it that. Uh, it was him and some other atheist guy versus Jeff Durbin from Apologia Radio and James White. Uh, you may be familiar with James White. I'm not even like the biggest James White fan in the world because I'm not Calvinist, that sort of stuff. But now I'm the biggest James White fan in the world because this video is just awesome. So this Greg Clark clown, uh, he manages to throw across the room in this debate the Book of Mormon, a Quran, and the Bible. Why he spared the Torah, I don't know, but just watch this. Do we know that these three people ever existed? Or could it be pen names? Mark Twain is the pen name. Dr. Oakley, whoops, my bad, I'm so sorry, I am partially blind, uh, is the pen name he uses to hide behind. Don't we all just hate that awkward moment when we're trying to be extremely rude and disrespectful to our interlocutors and by getting in their face, and then we drop the dang microphone. I just hate it when that happens. Keep this rolling, please. Mark, Luke, John, do you really think that there were names like that running around in the Middle East 2,000 years ago? No. No, we don't think that, nor has any Christian ever said that. Those are English translations. You'll remember from earlier this week we discussed uh, the manuscript evidence with respect to attribution to the authorship and the earliest manuscripts that we have. In fact, all every single manuscript that we have, complete manuscript that we have, attributes the Gospels to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is their Greek equivalent names or their Aramaic equi equivalent names. Obviously not the English names. I, anyway, Fast forward this. Let's get to the part where he starts literally throwing books. The Bible says it's true, so it must be true. The Bible is the word of God. God exists, therefore the Bible is infallible and inerrant. Well, let's take a look. The Book of Mormon says it's another testament of Jesus Christ. Must be true, right? What you all say is no. Wide right, no good. This guy's aim is about as good as the Cowboys kicker in the last two weeks. Please, don't stop this. Keep this train wreck rolling. The Koran! Not the Koran, bro. Don't do it. You know it's off limits. They're gonna drag you for this. Don't do it. Don't throw the Koran. It says, right here, right in the opening, first page, there's no doubt about this book. And you all Christians go, nope. Revelation, forget it. Self-affirmation, forget it. Rest in peace to the Quran. We had a good time, bro. A lot, of, a lot of good memories. So let's go to the Bible used by Jason Wallace's church, which he has personally assured me is infallible. He has personally assured me it is perfect. There are no mistakes in it. And we open his Bible, which he told me was no different from other Bibles that these guys use. And I turn to the Bible, and it says the most important claim or the most direct claim for this triune God, for our, there are three that best record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. What more proof could you have that the triune God exists except for the fact that... Wide right again. My man is 043 Get him out of here. This is insane. What's sad about this is obvious. The purpose of debate is to persuade your interlocutors and your audience. There are likely people in the audience who, for sure online at least, that have never given atheism much of a thought. So he has a golden opportunity here to persuade uh, some Christians or other people towards atheism, at least showing that atheism is a reasonable worldview and uh, something that they could subscribe to. So here they are listening for the first time to an atheist, and what do they get? 
pure anger and mockery. No argumentation, no rationality, no coherence of thought, just pure anger. I'd say he's angry at God, but he's clearly just angry at James White. Why Jeff Durbin got a pass, I don't know. Jeff Durbin and the Torah are safe on this one. He's only angry at the Book of Mormon, uh, the Quran, the Bible, and James White. Ask yourself two questions. Is this clown's aim to persuade Christians? No. Is his aim to learn something or to arrive at the truth through dialogue? Of course not. He's here to do exactly what he did. He prance around and make a show. He's here for himself. He just wants you to look at him and listen to him. He really only accomplished two things here. One, he made a fool of himself. And two, he guaranteed that any curious young Christians in the audience would never give atheism a second thought ever again. So for that, Greg Clark, we thank you. Okay, moving on from that pure gold, let's take a look at our scripture reading from the day, which is Luke chapter 1, verse 5 through 24. It says, It happened that in those days, uh, the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest, Zechariah by name, of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous in the sight of God, living blamelessly in all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. And they did not have a child, because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both advanced in years. And it happened that while he was serving as priest before God, in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter into the temple of the Lord to burn incense. And the whole crowd of the people were praying outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was terrified when he saw the angel, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. And you will experience joy and exultation, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he must never drink wine or beer. Bummer. And he, will never, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while he is still in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to prepare for the Lord a people made ready. And Zechariah said to the angel, By what will I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to announce to you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and not able to speak until the days, till the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and began to wonder when he was delayed in the temple. And when he came out, he was not able to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them, and he remained unable to speak. And it happened that when the days of his service came to an end, he went away to his home. Now after these days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days in which he has concerned himself with me, to take away my disgrace among people. Why do you think Luke uh, included this pericope about John the Baptist's birth, his parents, etc., in his gospel? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, leave us a review, and if you want, you can follow the support Help Me Believe link in the description below to become a patron supporter. My name is Hayden Clark, and this is Help Me Believe. Help me believe.